Right now, free speech is under heavy attack in New Zealand and overseas, with governments constantly devising new ways to enforce censorship. To make sure you never miss the critical news and breaking stories you rely on, join the RCR mailing list today. Get connected now at realitycheck.radio forward slash email. Liam here has been on the crunch before, and recently he's t- written some pretty good articles on his Substack, The Blue Review. One was about a very reluctant Chloe Swarbrook. It was satirical and quite funny. And another was his belief that a Maori parliament would do no harm. To talk about these and more, Liam joins me now. Welcome back to The Crunch, Liam, here. It's uh, great to have you back. And I want to touch on a couple of things today of some articles you've written on your uh, Substack, The Blue Review. The first one is uh, our little friend, Chloe Swarbrook. But welcome back anyway. Well, thank you for uh, welcoming me, and I'm glad to be back. Yeah, so Chloe Swarbrook has announced last week uh, or did another sort of hagiographic interview where she said, oh, look, she's very reluctantly taking up the job as the leader of the uh, Green Party and echoed the, her reluctance to being a politician. Now, you've written a satirical piece on this in the Blue Review. What's your views on Chloe Swarbrook and her reluctance? Well, you know, I, I'm very reluctant to, you know, share my <laughs> opinions, as, as you know, uh, you know, but, you know, destiny has forced me to um, to engage in some punditry on this issue. And so with great reluctance, I'll take up the, um, you know, the calling of the times and let you know that I think it's a joke, you know. Uh, but funnily enough, uh, Cam, that, uh, that article I wrote for the Blue Review about the reluctant politician, I wrote that a while ago, right? It was, I think it might have been a, about six or seven weeks ago at least. Yes. Uh, at, because it was the last time that that had emerged. And, you know, it got a bit of uh, it got a bit of attention. It was read quite well. The numbers were all right. And so, you know, sometimes, you know, when you puncture an image like that, um, the result is that the media backs off it. But they've only doubled down. They couldn't believe it that once again, we would have this article uh, or this podcast on, on stuff where the theme of the whole thing was, uh, you know, this is the person who never wanted to be a politician, despite the fact she spent almost uh, the, the great majority of her adult life anyway, either running for office or holding office or seeking office. You know, it's um, I, you can understand about politicians wanting to you know project a mythical image about themselves. You would think that uh, the, the the journalist uh, class, who, who so often hold themselves out as you know the people who puncture these narratives. They just go along with it, and that's <laughs> that's the biggest joke of all. Well, that's the thing, isn't it? With all of the uh, the you know the problems that there are in the media environment, you know, we where trust is falling. You've got all the media who are losing jobs saying, "But who's going to hold the powerful to account?" Well, it's not them. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so you've got somebody here who uh, will be a minister in a Labour Green government somebody who has created this fantasy that they're very reluctant about everything they do. And the media doesn't puncture that. As you say, the media doesn't skewer her and say, well, come on now, hang yeah, on a well, second. The issue is how partial it is, right? I mean, for, for whatever reason, and the thing is, I, you know, I've met Chloe Schrobert a couple of times. I actually found her really um, you know, delightful to have a conversation with. You know, I think that's true of a lot of politicians, to be honest with you. But, you know, when it comes to people like Christopher Luxon, I guess, you know, people quite will, will quite rightly and happily try to puncture the narrative he tries to put up about, about himself, uh, you know, and, you know, if he talks about being a um, this experienced businessman who ran an airline that quickly becomes a meme, you know, against him, and rightly so, and mm. the same went for, you know, Chippy from the Hut, you know, this... This, and John uh, Key, of course, being the money trader, they d- dug into that. The Labour yeah. Party actually spent vast sums of money trying to get John Key on the so-called H fee. Mm. But, uh, but for what, whatever, Smallbrook, what, yes. whatever, whatever reason, that narrative is just accepted, you know, um, and and not only accepted but amplified. And it is, uh, I wouldn't say it's frustrating. It's funny. I think it's funny because I don't. I think most people see through it. I mean, most people would see someone who's. You know, in their twenties, or has been a politician throughout their twenties, 
claiming to be a reluctant politician, and most people just laugh at that. And uh, and it's only the uh, the people who are sort of propagating that narrative in a self a self unaware way that are doing the real disservice to themselves. Mm. I mean, when she ran for the Auckland mayoralty, she was twenty two. She's now yeah. thirty. And she she did a great job, right? You know, she came third. You know, good on her, I suppose. Um, you know, but personally, you know, I think that um, career politicians we we criticise all the time. Sometimes career politicians turn out to be good politicians. And Winston Churchill was a career politician, right? Not that I'm comparing them. Not was he minute. reluctant? He was. He was pretty <laughs> reluctant too. Was- yeah, well, you know, he he would, he, I suppose, he might say so. But like like Schwarbrick, you know, he spent his whole time in and around politics, his whole adult life. Um, so it's it's you know, just own who you are. I would say own you know mm. own who you are. Uh, own that you're an ambitious person who wants to be at the at the top of things, um, wants to tell people what to do with their lives. Uh, and you know, you, I might not agree with that, but at least you could respect it a bit more. I mean. <laughs> You know, I've been uh, involved in politics for almost all of my life, in and around politicians, and I could be sort of conservative and say for 40 years, and I'm 55, but it's probably longer than that. And I have a very uh, cynical view of politicians. Um, In my view, the majority of them are sociopaths. Uh, They certainly have narcissistic personality disorder. And they don't enter this thing uh, called politics reluctantly, yeah. ever. I, I think you're right. I mean, okay, I, I'm not sure if you're right on a diagnosis because I'm, <laughs> I, I, I hope to say I'm, I'm, a, I'm just a humble jobbing provincial lawyer. I can't medically diagnose people. But I don't think something that, uh, that I've always felt is that anyone who gets into politics, anyone who puts their hand up for elected office, they see themselves as being in the big chair. Right, they like all, they, yeah, you're right. They all think they're the next prime minister. I know, and 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 I remember when David Cunliffe was asked, you know, before he became the leader, would you want to be prime minister? Oh, oh right. no, it'd be a horrible job. Can you can you imagine? Oh man, I the, 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 I could never see myself having to go through all that. You know, that's just so fake. It's uh, they all do. Even the lowliest list MP, even the lowliest backbench MP, they they dream that one day circumstances might just deliver them to the big seat they can all see themselves as prime minister i remember peter dunn when he was the um you know after the 2002 election mm. when united future had the big surge to six percent because and, of a worm because, <laughs> because, of, a worm. because <laughs> of a worm and he he did an interview where he said oh i can see a part you know the national party is in decline i can see a part, path when he's Zealand Fe- united future to come through the middle and i could end up being the prime minister you know and it just went to show that uh, yes, they all have their, those delusions of, of of power and grandeur. Every yeah. single one of them, and yeah. I, I'm I'm friends with them. That's why some of them are, are my mates, and that's okay. But you know, there's something wrong with you that makes you want to run for office, and it's uh, none of them. None of them are low on ambition. No, I mean you know, it 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 rather begs the question: of why no one in the media does a Nelson Muntz when they make these claims, you know, and just yeah. sit there and go ha ha, ha because. That's how credible their claims are. Yeah, I mean, you know, just 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 own it. I say. I mean, you, you and I, you know, I mean, we're hardly perfect, um, and you know, we wouldn't do commentary and um, we wouldn't get involved in uh, political controversies if we ourselves weren't, you know, didn't think, didn't sort of have a kind of an ambitious streak or a, a desire to be in amongst it and to you know make a difference. Um, and you know, there's a there's a certain vanity to that, right? I just think you should own it. You should just accept that that's part of who you are, and not try to pretend to be something you're not. Uh, I mean, are we going to see Chloe Swarbrick continue to make this claim that she's a reluctant politician, that she reluctantly is leading the Green Party? She'll reluctant. I, I can just imagine after the next election, God forbid, that the Greens are in a position to negotiate with uh, with Labour. And and I could just imagine her on election up. Well, reluctantly, I guess we're going to have to talk to the to the Labour Party. Yeah. <laughs> you know? um, there's no doubt that, that that narrative will continue because it's not getting any pushback, right? Like, why would you, as a politician, uh, uh, um, confront a more unappealing reality if the media was going to um, not only allow you to push a a, a different narrative? But actually support it and propagate it. So of course, until the day comes that people start laughing about it in the media, it'll continue. 
And that's the thing, Cam, is that uh, the one thing that destroys any type of pretension is being laughed at. And uh, howls of derisive last laughter, yeah. as they said in uh, in Monty Python, howls of derisive laughter. It's the great leveler. Yeah, but uh, I can I can still see it. I can picture it now. You know, they sign a coalition agreement. Uh, Chloe Sprawlbrook stands up and says, "Well." You know, the voters have chosen and reluctantly we've been had our hand forced and we're going to be forming a government with the Labour Party and reluctantly I'll be de- Deputy Prime Minister. <laughs> you know, yeah. just, just go on and on. Or re- 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 reluctantly I'll be the Minister of Statistics because that's what I really got into politics to do, to get a limousine yeah. for having a, um, you know, a low-priority, low-influence ministerial sinecure. That's what, that's what always frustrates me about little parties is, you know they 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 campaign on these big ideas and then they become minister of consumer affairs or something. Is it just little parties that uh, that the media fail to account, or is it just certain kinds of parties? Because we see the Green Party, and I mean, they they still got this uh, ongoing uh, investigation into Darlene Tarner. It's been ninety odd days um, on a fairly straightforward investigation. Uh, there's no real credible media questioning of that. You've got Te Party Maori who make uh, a, appallingly racist comments about everybody other than you know Maori, and then there's also their attacks on the wrong kind of Maori is the way they they look on it. But the media says nothing about that yet. Shane Jones says something, and all of a sudden it's a major scandal, and uh, New Zealand First are uh, demons personified. You know, Christopher Luxon makes a mistake on something, the media attack on that. Uh, you just don't see the same sort of uh, scrutiny of particularly the Green Party, who always sort of cower behind the shield of sanctimony and the cloak of hypocrisy. Um, and the Maori Party are exactly in the same position. It's like they're the media darlings and uh, we'll just ignore all of their uh, foibles, uh, f- false steps uh, and outright disastrous type policies and statements. But what about the Uffendor report? That's my that's what everyone would say in response to that. You know, yeah. like it's just <laughs> um look um well at least I we've think, had the Uffendel report, you yeah, know. It was done inside like in, in two months it was done. He but was look, a kid. The, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> the thing is, oh well the, the point I made the other day was that the Challenger shuttle inquiry when the Challenger space shuttle blew up, that was done inside I think, you know, 100 days or 105 days. And the Darlene Tarner, it was to work out why a space shuttle exploded, killing all those people. Yeah. The Darlene Tarner report is going to blow past that time frame to find out whether or not someone paid an employee or not. But look, <laughs> um, the thing is, I think that the, the, the points you make are, are essentially accurate. I think that um, the Green Party did used to be treated as a party with a lot more kid. Had a, they had a, there was much more of a kid glove approach than there is now. I think that it's come in a little bit. Um, and I remember when um, when Materia Toure confessed to uh, you know that she had um, had wrongfully claimed the benefit, right, or mm-hmm. something like that. There was some can't quite remember what it was, but it was it was a benefit in, incorrectly uh, fraudulently claiming a benefit. It was benefit or, fraud. Let's just yeah. state it what it was. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. And so um, and so there was a like a media interview about so if, if, at first if the media um, sort of rallied around her and it was going to be this big moment and the public really hated it the public hates any anything like that and it was a disconnect between the media and the public and so eventually the narrative turned on us a little bit and I think it might have been Audrey Young wrote a column about how maybe it might not have been Audrey Young so don't um, I'm not going to back up on that but someone wrote a column about how the Green Party were just sort of really the, the staffers were blindsided by the fact that the media were started, had started to ask them hard questions or weren't being as friendly, and they had sort of had this entitlement mentality that they would always be sort of treated in, with a sort of a friendly way, and so I think you know that the 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 gloves came off a little bit for that, and then we had the Green School fiasco. Remember that. Um, mm, all that money yep. that went to this for rich kids and um and, and a fancy private school that was called the Green School. Yep. And so um, you know, while I think Schwarbrick um has captured recaptured a bit of that um that the, that that sort of old un, unadulterated just glorious um cover, I think that the Greens, while they get off 
they get off easy still. They don't get quite, quite get off, get off quite as easy as TPM. And to party Māori, uh, I've just been astonished uh, over the last you know couple of years as that party's evolved into quite an extremist party that says extremist things that would get any other political um, any any other MP who who said those things. Um, you know, accusing the government of the day of genocide and things like that, they would be hounded out of politics. Well, and you yet- can remember, remember when uh, David Seymour made a, a quip about, um, you know, Guido Fawkes being the only yeah. person who ever entered Parliament with honourable intentions Yeah, and, and talked about, you know, him going into some government departments. The media were screaming, um, you know, David Seymour wants to blow up this ministry. Mm, that's and right. Yet, and yet we've got multiple... Maori Party MPs that are saying out loud yeah. that it's time for a revolution. Now, and no re- no revolution happens anywhere in the world without bloodshed. Yeah, well, I, th- I think personally you can – revolution, I think you can say, is a metaphor. What's not a metaphor is saying that the government is exterminating Maori. And do you remember when – uh, not Materia, uh, Tariana Turia – do you remember when she used uh, compared the uh, Pariahaka to the Holocaust or something? Yeah. Like, and that was like, it was a sort of an early Clark government, and there was this huge hullabaloo about it. And um, Clark made Turia apologise, you know, and, and it was wasn't a real apology, but it was this big pushback on it mm. uh, because it was an it was an extremely insulting and wrong thing to say. And yet here we have multiple instances of a political party saying that about the existing government and, uh, and you know, when they're co- confronted on it, they double down. And whenever it's reported in the media, there's always been this contextualising of it, right? You know, like it's never reported straight. It's always reported with a kind of a justification to it. And, uh, you know, uh, but it also comes down to things like, you know, the, um, the Māori Party's economic policy, right? They released the economic manifesto. It was insane like it had this insane wealth tax that would just impoverish the country. It was like a, it was almost like a Robert Mugabe type yeah. um, economic policy. No and questioning at all. No questioning anybody. of it. Or, or when it was questioned, it, there'd be one question and it'd be sort of laughed off. And then there was, there was never a follow up question. Right. And that's the, what's always been a little bit frustrating to me about TPM is that sometimes the media will ask questions, but they'll never ask the hard follow up questions. They'll always let um, let MPs and that party off the hook, and it's just uh, you know, and and I've w- always wondered what it was. Um, you know, I think part part of its fear, right? Part of its fear of being accused of being racist, uh, and um, so um, you know, not wanting to um, to 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 incite a, a backlash or a um, or a counter attack. But now that you know the story can't be ignored, uh, and you know we had some we actually had some pretty good journalism from the likes of Andrea Vance on it. Um, what we're seeing is that the, all of a sudden the Māori Party is struggling um, because for so long they've been pushing on an open door, right? For so long, mm, bad mm. bad behaviour has been either ignored or rewarded, and now that um, now that the story, you know, that's, that's that's I think that sort of that sort of bad behaviour is habit forming, right? And now that they're in the habit of it and it can't be ignored anymore. I think finally we're going to start to see some pushback and, um, you know, it's a start, but hopefully it goes further and we actually start to have a bit more confrontation uh, against TPM in terms of the zany, off the wall, uh, but frankly dangerous things that they say. Oh, I mean, you're absolutely right. I mean, I've raised the issue of them using uh, imagery of, I mean, I, I know they're flintlock um, pistols, but it's the imagery of guns nonetheless. Yeah. Uh, and burning in the background and videos with ominous music and war drums beating and that sort of thing, along with a message that says uh, revolution, that uh, Mm. we can do what we want, we can remove any government that we don't like. That sort of rhetoric, um, there's some people who who on on my own website say, oh, we should just ignore them, you know, they're just rowdies. Well, that's what they said about, um, a little Austrian fellow who wasn't a yeah. very good painter and had a silly <laughs> moustache. I will just ignore them, but yeah. but exactly the same situation kind of exists. You had Adolf Hitler who had this little gang of thugs who bullied, beat, broke, uh, smashed their way into power, 
Yeah. And we've got Te Party Maori with this rhetoric that's being also echoed by, ironically, the stormtroopers of the Mungra Mob who talk about that sort of thing um, and are closely aligned with many uh, of the gangs in New Zealand who are, you could argue, echo the thuggery and the behaviour that existed back in the 1930s in Germany. Well, they even use the same swastika, all right? Well, they so do. There we yeah. go. And, but, and uh, they even used a Zig Hale um, uh, chant, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. and bark oh, like dogs. Just, just like John Tamahiri. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, look, the, the thing is, I, I guess, um, yes, I think there is always a danger of saying, right, well, we didn't. It's like that movie Conan the Barbarian. Remember that movie? Yeah. Of just a few years ago, they were just another snake cult, you know, and it's sort of, it's true, you know, like small problems can become big problems just, you know, if you don't squash them. I guess that um, I'm probably less, a little bit less fearful of of it to an extent because I think that, you know, in the in in Germany in the in the after the First World War you had, you know, a country that wasn't didn't have a democratic tradition, didn't have a liberal tradition. And, you know, you, the country had just been defeated in a massive war and they were you know, um turning to, you know, someone who was promising to, you know, make the country um rise from the ashes. And of course also was it was a you know, appealing from a majority position against minorities. Mm. Not that I'm not that I'm saying it makes it any better. I'm just saying that it's a bit more. You know, you have a bit more to fear in that scenario than you do when I think the when TPM has quite a inbuilt limited audience. And 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 the point I would just try to make, and I've, this is this is the point I tried to make about my multi parliament thing that just got me mm. so um, it's got, got me so rinsed by the right <laughs> was it was that Tabati Maori doesn't win a lot of votes. You know, they ran about a hundred thousand votes in the last election. The rhetoric has a lot of purchase with the universities, the public sector maybe, and the media. Those are all institutions, sort of liberal institutions that are dominated by liberals that are in decline and are less and less trusted by the by the majority population. And I think that the conflation of um, of TPM with Mauridim is, is is just wrong. I mean, this this cabinet is forty percent um, I mean, people uh, people of Maori descent, right? And they're so, not the right kind of Maori. Though. That's the, that's what they say. You know, yeah. basically that when you read between the lines and what what to party Maori says, is they ignore that and they basically are saying they're the wrong kind of Maori. We saw that uh, the attack, the shameless attack on Karen Shaw, mm, yeah, wrong kind of Maori. David Seymour, he's a white Maori. Um, you know, yeah. this sort of behaviour, yeah. uh, outright racism, actually. Imagine saying that about, that about Shane Jones, eh? Imagine saying Shane Jones, with his life experience, everything he's done, saying that he's somehow not not a real Māori person, you know? It's mm. just incredible. But, you know, you, you know, like everyone in this, you know, in this country, you know, we interact with Māori every day, you know, uh, as friends and family and... Uh, and but we interact uh, with Kiwis every day. Yeah, but that's what I mean. They're just ordinary people, you know. They're, yeah. they're no different than than Pakeha or, you know, just get along. And so I think it's really a, a fictitious thing for the the media to make out like in some way Te Party Māori is the voice of of Māori in this country. It just just isn't. It's a small minority. Now that now I'm not trying to downplay the fact that it only takes a small number of radicals to make big problems. That's absolutely true. And if things progress to the point where we start to have real attacks on sort of civil society or, or an ordered society, then it doesn't take a whole lot of people to create a whole lot of problems. And the government government of the day has to be strong and forthright and to apply standards equally to stop that from happening. Mm. I mean, there are, there, it is a small group and you could ignore them, except, you know, I received uh, via email the other day this, I don't know how I received it. it. Somehow it's been sent to me for some reason. But this is the kind of wording that is in there. Uh, I'll just quote some of it for you. Movements are strengthening in Aotearoa, uh, working to further tino rangatiratanga decolonisation, constitutional transformation and tetiriti justice. That sounds okay at that stage. And it says here, at the same time, our present coalition government and its outright attack on a tetiriti-based Aotearoa are emboldening racist and reactioning, reactionaries. Challenging this backlash and anti-Maori racism is part of the ecosystem in creating a tetiriti-based future and all tangata tetiriti 
have a responsibility and role to play. Then they go on and say, some of you may recall that that Taiwi Tautoko began as Action Station Initiative and that we continue to support this kaupo. Taiwi Tautoko is now its own charitable. Now they use the word Taiwi, right? Mm. Which which it, it they say that means non Maori. It actually means uh, a foreigner, or yeah. or uh, even worse, a, a settler. And this, and it goes on and on. It says talking about um, they want to uh, uh, transform by challenging anti-Maori racism from within Tao Iwi communities. So they're saying within foreign communities. Yeah. So these are they're talking about communities that exist within New Zealand of New Zealanders of Kiwis of voters and calling them foreigners. Who is this, who is who is this from? Who did this well, come from? Well, I haven't. It, it's that bit's been trimmed off. Okay. But oh no, here we go. It's an, and for the Action Station and Tau Iwi yeah. Tau Toko team. So Action yeah. Station's a hard left bunch of yeah. uh, activists that are are pushing this narrative. Yeah. So so a- Action Stations are, um, are sort of like the Atlas Network, except for the media never covers it um, like that. You know, they're the. They're the, <laughs> they're the I always, when <laughs> someone says Atlas Network, I just imagine myself as. <laughs> Homer Simpson in the Simpsons movie where he backs into the hedge out of the way. Yeah. You know, it's like, okay, you went there, you went Atlas Network, mm. okay. Mm. <laughs> um, so people, I mean, people can say what they want, right? I mean, like, oh sure. I, I've been. My family's came to this country in 1842. All right, it's the only country I've got, don't have citizenship of anywhere else. You know, I've lived. Our families lived in the same district since the 1870s. I'm not a foreigner to this country. This is the only country I have. It's my home. And, you know, um, people can say what they want. I don't care. You know, that this is my home. And um, and uh, at the same time, I guess it's, it comes down to that, um, that freedom of speech thing. And we just have to trust, I suppose, that uh, for most people, that kind of thinking is a real turnoff. It's alienating. It doesn't have a lot of support. And the the trick is is to make sure that it doesn't worm its way into official mm. policy through the non democratic means, you know, through the public sector, through universities, by uh, osmosis, by osmosis, yeah. yeah, because because you know you, that's just a, to you know, and to accuse me of being a settler, settler, or you being a settler, we grew up here, you know, that uh, most people would see that for what it is, which is just insulting and ridiculous. Oh, I get it on I get it on X all the time. Someone says, "Oh, you're a racist," and I, and I always reply, "No, I'm a Fijian." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, I mean, you're not a real Fijian, though, Cameron, because um, you know, like you're not left wing, right? So that means you can't possibly be a person of color. <laughs> well, you know, I was born in Fiji. I've got a birth, Fijian birth certificate. I'm Fijian, right? I had I had to take New Zealand citizenship by descent, right? Not as of yeah, right, yeah. by descent. I remember well remember getting my first passport, mm. and I had to get it by descent. Yeah. So I mean, you could say I'm Taui, yeah, um, like, but, the, like, the, like the great African American Elon Musk. Oh yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, you know, it, it you, that's the thing. You wrote it, that article on the Blue Review, but you know, basically saying Maori want to marry Parliament. So what? Yeah, I mean, look, despite everything I've just said, you know, it's um, this country. We did have a treaty, right? And so we had, there was a the crown still exists. It's the same crown. Iwi still exists. It's the same iwi. It's not the same as every other ethnicity. There is a there is a difference. Uh, and um, and you know it's hard to give effect to that because you know it's, when the treaty was signed, um, you know Iwi, you know they genuine, genuinely had control of their own territory, and that's gone away. There's no territorial basis for any kind of autonomy anymore. Yeah. But if people want to get together and say, look, you know we've got a common heritage, we've got a common ancestry, we've got a common culture, we want to promote that, we want to try and have as much self determination as we can. That's just freedom of expression and assembly to me. We cross the line if you advocate for. I think you definitely cross the line if you advocate for uh, overthrowing the government or disobeying the government's laws. Mm. And maybe that will come, and that would be, and that would be something to to, to crack down on severely. But for something I always think about, Cameron, you might not, um, you might think this is weird. Is you know, I've I come from a culture that's a you know Irish Catholic culture. It was a 
with a thousand years of 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 that being handed down in our family mm. down to me. I want to be able to raise my kids in in our family religion. I want them to have our family values, and I want them to um, pass it on to their own children. Mm-hmm. Now, there are lots of people in the in the New Zealand state uh, or people involved in politics who who hate those values and think that those values are um, outdated and wrong and medieval. And should and be I, secondary to Maori culture and values, whatever but, those but, are. But even even just secular culture values and culture, right? Mm. And you know that um that, and so because I want I want the freedom to be able to to hand on that culture, right, and to be able to hand that on to my own children and to raise my children the way I want. I kind of just have a sympathy against sort of the the, the homogenization of everything and everything yep. having to be run like Wellington liberals want. And so I just have a I have an innate sympathy for people who want to preserve their own patrimony, and I think you know as long as it doesn't cross the line into actually advocating sedition or rebellion, and you know maybe the case can be made that that's already happened, but personally just haven't quite seen it yet. Until that happens, it just reminds me of some of the the mouldy parliaments that we've had in the past, right? Where mm. you, 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 they've just it was an, it was an advocacy body. There were two houses um, that gathered to, you know, to pass resolutions and to liaise with the government and make recommendations to the government and talk to the government, and even had prime ministers like Richard Seddon go along and observe. And it wasn't a threat because it wasn't something that was intended to supplant the law of the land, right? And so, and that's all the that's the only point I was trying to make. But here's the here's an interesting point though. That's fine. I, I I agree with you. I want to do the same thing with my family, with my children, my grandchildren, all of those sorts of things. I want to pass on that, uh, my own Christian faith in, in that regard. But I don't expect anybody to pay for that other than myself. No, that's true. Right? And this is where, you know, we have the grandstanding of Te Pāti Māori, Rawiri Waititi, saying that he's declaring independence from parliament. Well, he hasn't resigned from Parliament, so he's not independent of Parliament because he's still getting his salary. Yeah, uh, you know, and, and it's so it's it's grandstanding, but the the expectation uh, that they'll say that or well, Article Three of the treaty says that you'll pay for it, Whitey. Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> I don't know what. The, uh, yeah, look, that's not independence for one thing. You're no, quite, you know, you're quite right, and. Um, you know the, the the Katahi. I think it was called the uh, Katahi Hatanga. Um, that was which was the Maori Parliament in the nineteenth century. Uh, you know that. Um, I, you know that wasn't a state supported thing. Um, you had you, you did have people who were members of both. Um, that's because it wasn't seen as being inconsistent. And you know if um, if if TPM uh, or, or its um, you know outspoken uh, leadership was to say that they're wanting to supplant the New Zealand Parliament or replace it. Then I would completely agree with you, and that would be a completely hypocritical act on their or part. Wor- or worse, uh, establish a parallel system of government yeah. where our existing parliament has to consult uh, with and get approval from the Maori Parliament. Because yeah. I, I, th- I see that as an interim step that they would want to push. You know, yeah, as well, part of the partnership, as part of uh, you know that this lie that they never ceded sovereignty. You know, um, you know, I interviewed Catherine Ennis Carter last week and she said, you know, in the 70s and early 80s, the uh, predominant argument from Maori about the treaty was that they, that they was duped, that, that, mm. that it, was, it was a fraud, um, that they were tricked and as a result um, impoverished because of that. And of course, that's now morphed in the '90s and and the 2000s, and and where we are now, 24 years since the year 2000, into we never ceded sovereignty. You owe us everything, and Article Three says that you'll pay for it. So, and that's um, that, that's where we've got to <laughs> from a document that is a, a historic fact and is written there yeah. in in plain language for anyone who who cares to to know. There's this morphing of the meaning of words to say things that were never said or so agreed my, so, to. So my take on, on all that is a little bit contrarian too. I mean, I, mm. I've always said, like, you know, I think, you know, we can argue as a matter of history, like about what the treaty was designed for and what, what it was and how it was received, what was intended by the meaning of it. Um, but it doesn't change the subsequent history, right? And so 
sovereignty doesn't come from a treaty. Sovereignty comes from legitimate government, right? Like mm. the, um, you know, we don't go the back formation and, but, of a parliament, an ex of parliament, and, and, and acceptance forth- by the majority of the population. One hundred percent right, right? And so we don't go back and try and undo the Norman conquest on the basis that you know, um, <laughs> yeah, no, William, that's the or the or the Dane Geld area of, yeah. of Britain, you know, when but, the Vikings so, conquered two thirds of the UK. So, so the Norman conquest was, you know, William the second, uh, William the Conqueror said, um, "Look, I've um, I've got a claim to the throne of England." You know, it was a, it was a dubious claim, um, yeah, but you know, it, it was, was a claim, though. It was a claim, but the, it wasn't the claim that um, that established his sovereignty. His sovereignty was he actually exercised it, right? And it, he became the king, and over time, that evolved into what we now call the United Kingdom. Yep. And it's the same here, right? Like, you know, whatever the history was, the reality is that we have a sovereign crown. Uh, the crown um, is, you know, has a democratic uh, element to it. So it's got democratic legitimacy. It's the mm. only... It's a constitutional the only, monarchy. It's the constitutional monarchy. It, 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 you know, it it, it it checks the box in terms of being a, a efficient, fair, reasonable and uh, and accountable government, you know, to an extent. And know, we like and we know court. how and we know how Maori see that because well they started to set up their own kingi tanga movement and did set up their own kingi tanga movement because they thought it was a good idea. And their own parliament, right too, right? Mm. And attempts to that. Now the, the point that I would just make is that, you know, like it's a interesting and worthy historical inquiry, but it doesn't change the fact that the Crown has got sovereignty. The, the crown can't give up that sovereignty because the crown is democratically ev- accountable to, to everybody. I mean, I wouldn't, you know, to me, I wouldn't, it wouldn't bother me in the slightest, right? If we had a, a second chamber of parliament, and um, and you said, right, okay, well, look, in fairness, um, you know, there was clearly some sort of idea that the Rangatera would continue to have some sort of status or authority or some sort of voice distinctive as the as the basis of being the people who were already here and the people who signed the treaty. And as long as the ha- this upper house was a House of Lords type of a house where it, you know, it was a it was a revising chamber only, it could make suggestions only, kind of like a select committee, uh, and control remained with the democratic elements. It wouldn't bother me in the slightest if you were to have an upper house and you were to say, like the House of Lords, that um, you know there is a uh, a space for the um, for at least some seats to be allocated to the to the landed gentry or the nobility. In this case, um, you know the um, to to Iwi, right? And that wouldn't bother me in the slightest, just as it wouldn't bother me to be in England in the House of Lords and have you know some hereditary peers. Well, uh, other, that- other than the fact it goes against the Kiwi. Uh, ethos of Jack's as good as his master. You know, there's there's a reason yep. why we don't have an upper house, right? Yep, I know. Right. But 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 I'm, we're just trying to square different things here. And mm. what, I'm just all I'm saying is it wouldn't bother me as long as the control remained with the House of Representatives, like in the UK, right? The House of Lords can be a real pain in the neck, frequently is for the House of Commons. But mm. there's no doubt that the House of Commons is in charge because the House of Commons is the only body that represents everyone. Mm. Same goes for the House of Representatives in New Zealand. That's where its legitimacy comes from. It doesn't come from a piece of paper. Nor does it come from a, 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 a improperly stated declaration of independence. No, that's right. And that's the thing. So with the terms of what I was, you know, TPM want to have their own parliament, fine. You know, they, they can't they can't establish a, a state in New Zealand. Um, they 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 don't they don't have even the electoral support to really say that they represent Maori. So, uh, you know, good luck, guys. You know, it's on you. We have freedom of assembly. We have freedom of speech. We have freedom of uh, um, of of all sorts in this country. If you can, uh, you know, establish that you've got some sort of legitimacy to to speak for all Maori, then go for it. But you know, I just have to say that your work's cut out for you based on the low level of support that you have amongst the population at large. It's 3.08%, if you want to be particular about that. Yeah. 3.8%. Yep. 87,844 votes. And, you know, it's interesting because I looked at the results for the Manurewa electorate because it's pertinent at the moment with these allegations of, well, impropriety and all sorts of other things. Um, the the actual votes that, that were cast in that electorate were, well, let's just say scant. Well, that's the thing about those electorates is why they're so un- unpredictable, right? Is that they're set on basis of population, 
by the turnout so low that uh, you know you can have these wild results. Re- remember, didn't um, remember uh, Titai Tukarau and and how easy that one was to influence. You know, like remember, the, mm. was there a by election? Wasn't there? Did Kelvin win that in a by election, or what? What happened? I can't quite remember. You were involved. You did a um, Operation Chaos type thing, didn't you? <laughs> so they say. Um, I can't really remember. <laughs> I'm not accusing you of anything, but I, I remember it was a, a there was a, a movement to sort of um, to support Calvin Davis against Honey Harrera, I think. Yeah, from something memory. like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, I mean, the total votes cast in Tamaki Makaro electorate: twenty five thousand votes were cast. Twenty five thousand six hundred and four. Yeah. Pene Henry got 10,026 and Takatai Tash Kemp got uh, 10,068, a margin of just 42. Yeah. But those are small numbers. Yeah, I know. You know it's, and that's why they're so un- un- unpredictable, right? That's you, you, mm. you can easily influence them. Now, a really interesting thing is if you're talking about inconsistencies, do you remember all the times that people were saying about X, um, oh, sort of distorted I just, parliament? Yeah, I, I just because laugh of the it overhang? off. Yeah, and yeah. but but nobody ever ever talks about the issue, the democratic issues with the overhang, um, with the strategic voting and the Maori electorates. Think, I don't think I don't think anybody's mentioned the overhang that was created by the Maori Party getting three no, percent no. of the votes and getting you know seven no. elect- seven seats. You know? Yeah, but when, nobody but when, said it. Not even mentioned, is it? No, and and so you know if, if, you can imagine if X and uh, had a similar sort of thing where they won more electorates consistently than party yeah. vote entitlements, there would be calls to reform MMP almost daily. But well, you, course, you see that you see similar complaints too about they talk about the big money in elections and ACT has got the big money, and and I always just laugh at people who make those claims because if money bought elections, mm. ACT would be the ma- the majority party. They just yeah, it's, it's spend proof, an right? absolute fortune, right? But they don't it's, get a, the results. That's because their pr- ideas aren't, aren't accepted by the majority it, of New Zealanders. Yeah, it's proof that you can't uh, buy elections. It's just correct. It, it is, and in fact, the more that you put out your um, your, your propaganda efforts, if, uh, the, the more widespread it is, um, the more damage you might even do to yourself if people don't agree with it. Right. Well, yeah. Exactly. And Colin Craig's the other example. He spent yeah. you know something like five million dollars and didn't get into Parliament. Thank yep. God, you know, yep. I might have had a hand in that. But um, <laughs> oh, well, Gareth Morgan, Gareth Morgan, Gareth Morgan. No, so there's three data points that show that money doesn't actually influence no. elections. It's ideas that influence elections. Right. I, the other thing I'd say to that, and this is why I think that sort of battles over the National Party, uh, you know, are, are, are important, is that you know both the National Party and the Labour Party, like they have they have you know hundreds you know between them a couple of hundred years of history. Hmm. And that means they've got networks and machinery and ins and institutional knowledge mm-hmm. that, um, that the other parties just don't have. And I actually think that matters a lot more than people in the media um, sort of are willing to recognise. It's the it's the your ordinary Joes who are you know your volunteer networks, people who are going out and dropping leaflets, and that 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 gets you more support than than money can. And that's hmm. why it was always annoying to me. I mean, people would say, oh, we'd like to have a sort of a social conservative party that would just be outside of the National Party providing support to it. And the National Party can continue to be the sort of urban liberal party, you know, the senior partner. And I was like, well, no, you leave, because actually it's not just, um, you know, the brand or whatever. It's also all of that machinery underneath, all of those networks. Well, we saw that at the knowledge. last election. We saw that at the last election, too, with you know, uh, Liz Gunn and her law- New Zealand Loyal Party. Yep. If you could call it a party, dictatorship's probably a better word. But yep. um, this is the problem. I get people all the time, they say to me, Cam, I'd like to, you know, engage you to um, look at the setting up of a new political party. And I almost invariably turn it down because they can never ask mm. answer two basic questions. What is your plan to get 5% yep. of the vote? And the second question is, what's your plan to win an electorate seat? Yeah. And they, they usually sit there and go, um, there's a lot of angry people. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. there was a lot of angry people at the last election, and it didn't work. Mm. Right? So uh, that doesn't translate into votes. Likes on Facebook don't translate into votes. Yeah. Um, you know, re- I- retweets don't translate into votes. It's like everything, right? Like, it looks easy from the outside, and... 
you know, people can, they read the news and they'll read blogs and they'll think, oh, I could do this. But actually, as people have been around politics, you know, you and I both know that actually it's a lot of hard work and organisation that, that goes uncredited. And that's why I think political parties like the National Party, to be honest, need to be a bit better to their volunteers and a bit more, uh, you know, cultivating and respectful of their volunteers because actually, yep. you know, it's... Man, it's I can easy. remember when they Don't launched treat them a membership. Like employees. Yeah, yeah, I can remember when they they launched a membership card. I was a member back then. That's yep. I haven't been a member for fifteen years of the National Party, but that's when they launched a membership card. And I got this piece of plastic, and I thought, well, what do I get for this? Yeah, right. I've donated some money. What do I get for being a member of the National Party? Well, what what you got was a plastic card. Yeah. That, that was it. You don't get mm. any thanks. You don't get anything yeah. else. There's no special privileges for it. And, in fact, the only thing I could come up that that plastic card was useful for was scraping the ice off the windscreen on the <laughs> two days of the year in Auckland mm. where you get a frost. So, some of them, some some MPs, are, in fairness, are good at it. And you think um, some Ian Browns are, are someone that I think is, is an example of Ed someone Collins who's extra- is another one. Yep, yep. They're both, ex- yeah, Judah Collins is a great example. They look after their electorate. They've got a very strong electorate organisation. Yeah. Uh, their volunteers are appreciated. Yeah. Um, and that's why they've got very, very high memberships because and even, even people when value they go, that. Even when they go out of their electorate and come and visit the provinces, mm. they mingle amongst members. They treat members with respect. And you know, that leads to a lot, you know, that leads to a lot of staying power. Right, and mm. just does, and you know. On the other hand, if you have people who are, uh, you know, parachuted into, that's what I always really hate a little bit. Sort of um, people who come back from overseas, they've had a, made a lot of money overseas, yeah, and they come John, back and they're like John Key, Christopher Luxon. <laughs> <laughs> um, look, I'm not. Don't draw me into anything like that. Oh, I'll, please. <laughs> I'll go there. I'm happy to go there. No, I, it was my uh, father that recruited John Key well, into the National Party. Well, well let's go with uh, David Kirk. Okay. All right, well, yeah. you know, okay. So you know, people well, well, are, I was involved in that too. <laughs> yes, I know. That's why I brought it up. So you know, people who are, you know, um, the, 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 they always think that you should be grateful to them for yeah. for them for them putting their hand up to stand. And I just think that you know, like we got to the politics should we should deter as many of those people as possible, right? Like you should need to put your time in at getting to know members, yeah. being a true a true party member. Um, instead of like being someone who is parachuted like, in, yeah, a lateral hire, you know, like you're a lateral, you know, we should, we should be fewer lateral hires. And well, that think- was a spectacular failure with David Kirk. I mean, they picked the wrong electorate to put to parachute him into. Yeah. I mean, with yeah. a, a, I mean, Clem Simich was a, an earnest sort of a fellow, but not particularly bright, but he was a local. Yeah. Yeah. Right? And, 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 that's and the Tamaki like- Mafia worked really hard on that. And that's what and they I lo- were known inside the National mm-hmm. Party. And I love that story for that reason. You know? Yeah, it's like you can't just sometimes it doesn't work. You just get yeah. um, you just get smashed. Well, we're coming up against time, Liam, but I think we've traversed quite a few topics there. Yeah, no, uh, I enjoyed it. It was good talk. Yeah. So thanks so much for coming on the on the crunch, and uh, we'll have you back again soon. It was my pleasure. Liam's article about Chloe Swarbrick was satire, but nonetheless, it was on point. And it seems it's a political construction of her own talking points that the facts show to be nothing short of intellectual dishonesty on her part. Naturally, the media go along with it. I'm in two minds about his views on Te Party Māori and a Māori parliament, though. What do you think? Email inbox at realitycheck.radio or text to 2057. Thank you for tuning in to RCR, Reality Check Radio. If you like what you're listening to or dislike what you're listening to, either way, we want to hear from you. Get in touch with us now. You can text us with your message to 2057, that's 2057, or email us at inbox at realitycheck.radio. We would love to hear from you, so connect with us today.